If you have your Bibles, let me ask you to turn to the prophecy of Jeremiah. 20th chapter of Jeremiah, beginning at verse 7 and continuing through verse 9. If you have it, let's stand together as we reverence the Word of God. Jeremiah 20, verse 7 and following. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with foreboding and forbearing, and I could not stay. I want to talk for the next few minutes on the burning in my bones. The burning in my bones. Much as I am drawn to him, and much as I am intrigued by him, there is something about the prophet Jeremiah that ought to give one pause. Make no mistake about it. There is something winsome and alluring about this Reverend Jeremiah, prophet of the 8th century before our Christ. A careful reading of the primary text that catches his tears and absorbs the frequent flooding of his eyes will reveal a preacher prophet whose words did not gain popularity, whose call seemed more than he could handle, and whose assignment in ministry seemed more than he could accomplish. Of course, you know this Jeremiah. The outline of his ministry is set forth in rigorous detail in his writing. Born the son of Hilkiah and a resident of Anatoth in the land of Benjamin, he was a prophet during the reigns of Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, the last five kings of Judah, until at the last, Jerusalem and its inhabitants were carried away captive in 586 BC, condemned to sit along the river banks of the Babylon, refusing to sing, left only to weep when they remembered Zion. More to the point, there was something special about Jeremiah's relationship with God. Theirs was no casual relationship. From the day of his birth, there was always something different, something distinct about Jeremiah and God. God and Jeremiah, their own special tandem. Early on in the unfolding of this writing that bears the prophet's name, God speaks to Jeremiah in order to clarify the relationship. Jeremiah before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Still, there was something different, something distinct about God and Jeremiah. It was more than verbiage. What defined the God-Jeremiah relationship was more than words, more than rhetoric, more than casual sentences strung together. Jeremiah always had questions for God. God always had an assignment for Jeremiah. To be sure, God placed God's hand 
on Jeremiah's mouth. God had placed God's stamp on Jeremiah's life. There was nothing casual here. This was not a relationship of unintended or casual chance. God touched the prophet's mouth. And in so doing, God had gained Jeremiah's attention. Jeremiah, not only did I touch your mouth, but I need you to understand that I have put my words, my words, not your words. I have put my words from my mouth to your mouth. My, my word have I put in your mouth. And this, Jeremiah, will be your assignment. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And still I say, as much as I am drawn to him, as much as I am intrigued by him, there is still something about the prophet Jeremiah that gives me Paul. To examine this matter more fully, certainly there is much to commend Jeremiah when in her deepest despair, Judah is uncertain as to where God is or what God is doing. It is Jeremiah who puts on his prophetic garments and declares that whatever the nation was experiencing did not take God by surprise. Jeremiah posits that indeed God is aware of where God is and what God is doing. It is Jeremiah who reminds the nation that you may not know what the future holds, but it is certain that you can know who holds the future. And here's what God says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So come closer to this word, if you will, for it is here in the 20th chapter of his writing that Jeremiah reveals the hidden truths that are resonant in his prophetic soul and reveals the internal thoughts of his prophetic conscience. It was Je Je Jeremiah who in spite of the circumstances that surrounded Judah, made every effort to keep the nation positive in a negative situation. It was Jeremiah who understood that the nation was broken, the national economy was in a shambles, and that her internal politics could only lead to certain disaster and devastation and destruction and death. And that is why God spoke this word, Judah, if you want to be redeemed, if you want to be reconciled, if you want your broken pieces mended, if you want the shattered shards of your existence put back together again, here's what you must do. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Go down to the potter's house. It's that house that is situated on the outskirts of town. It is that house that is located in the deepest part of the ghetto, a place of death and not of life. It is that house of broken people and broken pieces and broken hope. But if you go there, you won't have to say a word. I'll let you see something that you've never seen before. If you go there, I'll let you see my restructuring process. I will let you see the lives that were thrown on the junk heap of human history. I'll let you see lives that were irretrievably lost and left for dead at the city's garbage dump. If you go there, you can see for yourself that the potter wants to put you and the nation back together again. And in fact, Jeremiah, at the potter's house, I will let you hear my word. That, of course, is not the end of Jeremiah's story. What gives me pause is that by any analysis, Jeremiah's ministry was a failure. If ever there were a prophetic flaw, it was Jeremiah. He looked like a preacher. He talked like a preacher. He walked like a preacher. He dressed up to be attired like a preacher, but the inescapable reality was that at the primary assignment of his life, Jeremiah was a failure. What he preached, nobody wanted to hear. 
those to whom he preached were either antagonistic toward what he said or apathetic toward who or what he was say that another way if you will those who heard him either disliked him when they heard him or didn't care for him when they saw him what he prophesied no one would believe where he walked no one would want to follow his garments were frequently tattered and torn his residence was oft times a local dungeon to be kept there in solitary confinement and don't forget it was Jeremiah whose body was wracked with the pain of 40 lashes it was Jeremiah whose dignity was compromised while they accused him of the crimes of a common criminal spoke of him as a traitor to his country and kept him bound in rough hewn stocks and that's why I tell you that by any means of measurement Jeremiah was a failure at the grand arrangement and assignment for his life and to be sure there was a reason why Jeremiah was a failure Jeremiah was a failure in the first instance because he was set up to fail he, he, he did not intend to fail failure was not on his mind in fact it, it looked like a setup from the get up it was, it, was on, it was on that setup issue that caused Jeremiah to speak directly to God O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. I set up from the get up. This was Jeremiah with an accusatory finger pointed toward God. You deceived me. Nobody else deceived me. My enemies did not deceive me. You deceived me. Thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. And the only reason you could deceive me is because you're stronger than I am. Every day folk talk about me. Every day my friends talk about me and laugh at me. They, every time I stand to preach, I am become a laughing stock for the nation. And you did this to me. I thought we had it like that. But you did this for me and I'm satisfied it was just a setup from the ghetto. But that's not all. Jeremiah was a failure primarily because he was a preacher who could not preach. I realize I'm standing on dangerous ground in this present theological company, but there is something particularly painful about a person who claims they have been called to preach and yet are unable to demonstrate that they have the requisite skills equal to fulfill the assignment. I'm trying just to talk, no pushing aloud, no not only not only did others know that jeremiah could not preach jeremiah knew that jeremiah could not preach in fact jeremiah confessed it early on that preaching was not his gift said jeremiah i am disqualified from this preaching business for two reasons first of all i cannot speak you want me to be a preacher but i have this problem that i can't talk my words get twisted. I cannot control this stutter of mine. I get hung up in the emotion of the moment and my brain runs ahead of my tongue. I tend to lose the opportunity to make my argument in an articulate or in an elegant manner. I'm enrolled in seminary. I am a student of homiletics and hermeneutics. I have made, however, the mistake of taking Hebrew and systematic theology in the same term that's a big mistake you don't want to do that I'm trying to learn how to be a prophet by sitting in classrooms to be taught by prophets somebody told me that if you want to be a prophet it is required that you hang out where prophets hang out and still I don't know I, I just don't know why you would put this preaching assignment on me because the truth of the matter is that I can't preach and Second of all, I am disqualified from the preaching business because I am too young. God, you have known me from the earliest point of my existence. And that means you already know that I'm a child. That means that not only am I disqualified, I am ineligible for preaching assignments. 
People keep on asking me if I have heard any word from the Lord. But evidently they don't realize that I'm disqualified. My academic uh, credentials are not in order. My curriculum vitae are incomplete. I know I told you this, but I'm going to tell you again. My tongue tends to get tied. And I'm unable to argue the case with fluidity and grace. I cannot speak with the intensity or the integrity or with the elegance that is needed. I'm too young for this preaching profession. Here's why. A child hasn't lived long enough to preach to his elders. A child hasn't experienced enough of life to give preaching counsel to those who are his seniors. A child has more lessons to learn, lessons that are only taught in the school of hard knocks. Jeremiah was a failure. If for no other reason than this, Jeremiah could not preach. Jeremiah was too young. Yet there's more. There's more. For only Jeremiah... Not only was Jeremiah a failure, those who knew him best found in him a strange sensitivity not common to most. Jeremiah was a crybaby. <laughs> Everywhere you found Jeremiah, he was always crying and blowing his nose. Pa parenthetically, let me disabuse you of the notion that preachers don't cry. Let me disabuse you of the notion that preachers can stand apart from life's trials and trauma and remain aloof and unaffected. Let me disabuse you of the spurious idea that those who preach are protected and shielded and spared from the tragic exigencies of life. But that's only because there are some tears that you cannot see. There are some tears that are shed in the privacy of your loneliest praying ground. There are some broken hearts that cannot be detected by the natural eye. There are some hurts that are too deep for human reckoning to understand. But listen, you show me a preacher who stands by hospital beds when life's final curtains are being drawn. You show me a preacher who has come to know and to watch the destruction that only cancer in its various forms can invoke. You show me a preacher who stands nearby a freshly turned grave. You show me a preacher who week by week must hear the stories and testimonies of broken promises and broken dreams and destroyed hopes and I'll show you a preacher who will cry I read it in the writing called Hebrews we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. John said it best because even Jesus wept. Well, you excuse me, but that's why I love Jesus. He cares enough about me to cry for me. He cares enough for me to wipe away the tears from my eye. You can call on him day and night, and night and day he holds my hand when others have left me all alone. That's why I love him. And of Jeremiah, what shall we say? So caught up was he in the pain predicament of those to whom he preached. Somehow he wanted to take their place. You must understand that when the people hurt, Jeremiah hurt. When the people cried, Jeremiah cried. When the people limped along on crutches, Jeremiah, Jeremiah cried. And so caught up was he in the pain predicament of his people. That his desire was that his head would be filled with waters. That his eyes might become a fountain of tears. It was as though he had not cried enough. He needed more water to cry more still. It was because of his sensitivities that Jeremiah's life would only be complete if he were able to weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of his people. So they called him because of his incessant weeping. They called him because of his eyes always swollen and red. They, they called him because it wept and it seemed as though he would just keep on weeping. That's why they called him the weeping prophet. And so that's where we are. Inaugurating presidents Sending students to seminary. That's where we are. Those of us who are preachers. 
but who would rather not be preachers. That's where we are. Those of us who claim to be preachers but who appear to have minor skills for a major assignment. That's, that's where we are. Th those of us who yet stand in the academic line in order to gain our bona fides for the preaching profession, that's, that's where we are. Those of us who are too sensitive or those of us who are too emotionally invested such that we cannot see because of the incessant tears that stain our eyes and blind our vision, that's, that's where we are. We are right where Jeremiah was, searching for answers that seem to elude us, searching for something that can heal us in spite of us, searching for something that can make sense out of the senselessness of the world in which we live, searching for something that can accommodate the brevity of our years. And here's the problem. Here is the angst of the preacher. The more we preach, the more things stay the same. The more we preach, the more we thought we were saved, but we still need to be rescued. The more we, the more we preach, the more we come to acknowledge that Gardner Taylor is right. Preaching is such a clumsy tool. The more we preach, the more we stand astonished by our own pain. And the more we preach, the more we are convicted of our own sinful situation. And the more we stand up here on preaching ground, the people are still broken. And our tears never end. And if that's the problem, then this is the Jeremiah question. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? If there is a bomb, if there is a physician, then why are my people still sick? And why am I caught up in this preaching business, trying to preach an assignment for which I am singularly unqualified and woefully inept? So I ask again, is there no way out? Is there no solution to the quandary? Is there no way to make sense out of my situation? So then, what, what, what are my options? First of all, here's, here's what Jeremiah, Je Jeremiah said. Then I said, I will make no more mention of him, yes. nor speak in his name anymore. Eugene Peterson translates these words and suggests that there comes a time when you just want to say, forget it. Forget it. But if I understand Jeremiah appropriately and accurately, forgetting is not an option. Every preacher knows that there are some times when you just want to say, forget it. But you know in your heart that forgetting is not an option. There are times when I would like to eradicate his name from my vocabulary, but forgetting is not an option. There are times when it would be comforting to know that I would never need to speak in his name again, but forgetting is not an option. You see, the reason I call his name in the first place is because I cannot forget. I cannot forget what the Lord has done for me. I cannot forget how I got from where I was and where I used to be to where I am. I cannot forget that I am what I am by the grace of God. I cannot forget when I look back over my life and when I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. I cannot forget that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I should have been gone a long time ago. I cannot forget how he has made a way, open doors on my feet, food on my table, gas in my car, and a job to go to in the morning. I cannot forget. And there's a reason I can't just forget. 
Because I know that every day of my life, the Lord keeps on blessing me. Over and over and over and over and over and over. He keeps on blessing me. John Scoglin didn't teach me this. But over and over again and over and over again, I found out I just can't quit. First option. First option is to say, forget it. Second option is like unto it. And I can say, I just quit. But listen, my forgetting, more than forgetting, quitting is a permanent dissolution of the relationship. More than forgetting, quitting says, I don't want to be attached to you any longer. More than forgetting, quitting seeks to bring an end to what has become an unhealthy and unwholesome relationship. I don't have to do this. I can get me another job. In this economy? I don't think so. I, I don't have to do this. I do not have to subject myself to the indignities of preaching to folk who don't want to hear. Trying to lead folk who don't want to be led. And living with folk who laugh at me in my face and scandalize my name. So I tell you what, I thought about this thing. I quit. I just quit. I quit. I, I, I quit. Everybody knows that I can't preach. My friends know I can't preach. My enemies know I can't preach. I know I can't preach. God knows I can't preach. So instead of continuing this painful pretense called preaching, let's just bring it all to a grinding halt. And I'll just bid you good evening by saying to you and everybody else, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I quit. But Jeremiah has a problem. Jeremiah has a problem. For those who would quit, there is a problem. Jeremiah could not quit on God because God would not quit on Jeremiah. Through the storm, through the rain, God has not given up on you. Through sickness and pain, God has not given up on you. Let's get down to it. After all, God has had to put up with you. God never quit on you. After all your faults, all your failures, and your foolishness, God has never quit on you. After all of your stuff, anybody in here know you got some stuff? Seminarians come here because they have to come face to face with their stuff. Seminary professors offer up lecture after lecture until they have worked out their stuff. Traveling preachers stand in prestigious pulpits, but they never want you to know that no matter how many letters are behind their name or how much regalia adorns the neck, they are still trying to work out their stuff. And with all that God has seen you through, don't you ever forget that God never quit on you. The reason I know that God never quit on you is because you're still here. You got blood that's still running warm in your veins. You're, you're still here. You still have the activity of your limbs and the articulation of your tongue. You are still here. Yes, you're sometimes up and sometimes down, but you're still here. You are broken. You are battered. You are bruised, but you're still here. They said you'd have been gone by now, but look at you. You're still here. They said you'd never make it as a preacher, but look at you. You're still here. When everybody else had given up on you, when everybody else saw the worst in you, somehow God saw the best in you and that's why you are still here in spite of your situation and in spite of your circumstance you can still tell somebody honey I'm still here and that's why you cannot quit on God because God didn't quit on you so here's where we are life has placed you in an uncomfortable place a distinguished place no doubt God has placed you in a challenging place. 
For as much as you would like to do better, you don't seem to get better because it appears that you are woefully unsuited for your assignment. Whatever the assignment of your life may be, whether to preach from the pulpit or from the pew, you appear to be a failure. You really cannot preach and you are so sensitive to what is going on around you that your tears are always filled with more water than they can hold. At the same time, you would really like to forget this assignment, but you cannot forget. You would like to forget, but you cannot forget that nobody but the Lord has brought you from a mighty long way. In addition to which, maybe, if forgetting won't do, maybe you can just quit. Maybe, maybe tonight, you could turn in your preaching robe. Maybe you could take off your preaching shoes. Maybe you could trash your hymn book. Maybe you could get rid of your preaching towel. Maybe you could tell all your adjutants to go home. Maybe you could just eradicate from your mind all of those scripture verses you've got memorized. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If you want to forget, you ain't going to need that no more. How about the Lord is my light and my salvation? Yeah. Whom shall I fear and of whom shall I be afraid? That, that won't help you any longer. You, you quit, remember? And, and then how about I will bless the Lord at all times. His, <laughs> his praise shall continually be in my mouth. You, you can find somebody else to say that in their spare time. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those are just words. You're not going to need them anymore. Just words. Just words. Uh, wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he will strengthen thine heart. More words. More words. More words. We just all got more words. So then, just in case you cannot forget, and just in case you just can't quit, and just in case you cannot retire, maybe it would be helpful from the Jeremiah perspective to understand that your deficiency is God's opportunity. Your weakness is God's opportunity to demonstrate a strength that you never knew you had. The very thing you thought would bring you down is God's tool that will stand you on your feet. Anything that does not kill you retains the capacity to bless you. Anything that doesn't kill you retains the capacity to bless you. And at the very moment when you feel there is nothing left in you, that's God's opportunity to put something in you that you never thought you could have. And at the very moment when you thought there was nothing in you, God looked beyond your fault. So you need. Come here, Jeremiah. What did you say? Come here, Jeremiah. Talk to me, boy. What, what did you say? Then I said. I will not I will not make mention of him nor nor speak his name. Live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Listen, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand. The word of our God stand forever. That which made a difference in Jeremiah's life was the word his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones in my bone that which distinguishes me as a vertebrate animal in my bone the source and essence of my anatomical structure in my bones the fire was in that place that holds me together in my bones the hard tissue that forms the skeletal structure that sustains and keeps me the fire was in my bones you must understand this fire this is more than abraham's fire 
You remember that fire of Mount Moriah's sacrifice. This was more than Moses' fire. The fire of God's presence that caused a bush to burn and yet not be consumed. This is more than Nebuchadnezzar's fire. That fire that put those three Hebrew boys in a fiery furnace. This is more than Elijah's fire. The fire of Mount Carmel sufficient to bring about the death of 450 prophets of Baal. This is more than Job's fire. A fire that made Job cry out, When he has tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. This is more than Isaiah's fire. That fire taken by tongues from the altar and placed its burning fires on Isaiah's lips. No matter how hard it is, there yet remains this burning fire. And it's in my bones. Tell somebody, it's in my bones. No matter how lonely the days, no matter how long the days, no matter how dark the night, there remains this burning in my bones. Left here for a final time in 1975. He's been keeping me all this time. Making me go to prayer meeting. Making me go to Bible study. Forcing me to preach. And it just got down in my bones. Sometimes I would rather stay home. But I've got this burning in my bones. Sometimes I'd rather keep my mouth shut, but I've got this burning in my bones. Sometimes I don't have anything to say, no sermon to read, no nothing to preach, but I still got this this burning in my bones. Sometimes my manuscript looks like words on a page, but I've got this burning in my bones and every time I come down to the church house I can hear old Jimmy Mosby singing what is this yeah. it makes me feel so good right now what is this it makes me want to run on anyhow whatever it is and I really didn't understand what it was all about until one day like David this is what David said as I was musing, <laughs> the fire burned. I was musing. I was pondering. I was in deep thought. And the fire burned. And in that moment, it was revealed to me that my assignment was simply to be a part, not of the great preacher's society, I'm not going to make that meeting. But my task is simply to be a part of an incendiary fellowship. Yes. Jeremiah's assignment and mine is not just to be another preacher like the other preachers. When God's word is burning on the inside of your heart, God intends for you to be a spiritual arsonist. Everywhere you go, you ought to be so on fire. So on fire for God that everything you touch is set on fire. Every time you come into the presence of God, Everything you touch is set on fire. When you come into your sanctuary, there ought to be such an atmosphere of worship that it looks like the whole place has been set on fire. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Every time the deacons pray, deacons ought not be satisfied until they pray and the whole church is set on fire. The Sunday school is not there just to look at a few Bible verses and then go on home. Somebody needs to take the word and absorb the word and spread the word 
word and all you go set the church on fire ushers have an assignment to do more than lead someone to a seat on your way down the aisle you need to lead somebody to Christ and set the church on fire the choir needs to know that it's more than notes in a hymn book musicians need to anoint their instruments in such a manner that when the choir sings they won't stop singing till they set the church on fire I say they ought to set the church on fire do not discount this fire do not discount this fire that burns in my bones for whether you like it or not we have a fire Luke says it's a fire that is still available and when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind and it filled all of the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them listen my brothers and my sisters we have a fire that can change the world we have a fire that can alter men and nations we have a fire that can warm these cold hearts of ours we have a fire that can give strength to the weak and hope to the hopeless and power to the powerless and love to those who have no love you can't forget you can't give up you cannot quit you cannot throw in the towel you cannot desert your post you cannot walk out on God you are a part of an incendiary fellowship so wherever you go and whatever you do let the fire burn so here's what I want you to do the next time you come to church make it up in your mind that you're going to set it on fire when you come into the pulpit you ought to have a notion a preordained notion that your task is not just to preach but your job is to set the world on fire don't just preach any old sermon preach the sermon that is based on the word of God and it will set the church on fire set it on fire don't just sing any old song sing to the glory of the Lord comes down set it on fire in every pew set it on fire 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 